Welcome to our weekly worship service. This is PC Evangelical and Reformed Church in Potter, Wisconsin, a non-denominational Christian church. I'm Pastor Mark, and it's really a blessing to be able to bring the Word of God to you. Today we'll be looking at 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 13 through 22, but today we're only going to have time to look at verse 13 and verse 14, and we'll be talking about doing good in a world that's not always good to us. We can all relate to that. We've all been in situations situations where the world hasn't been as good to us as we've been to it. And so I want to encourage people to keep doing good for God even when, situ when it's not always appreciated by people. We know it's appreciated by the Lord. And as always, our worship services are Sunday mornings at 9 o'clock. If there's anyone looking for a church family, a church home, place to hang your hat, Love to have you here at Peace Church. We also have Sunday school for students of all ages in the fall, winter, and spring at 10 a.m. Let us begin with prayer. And Father God, thank you for your scriptures. Thank you for your presence and love and compassion in our lives. We dedicate the service to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. Welcome to PC Evangelical and Reformed Church. It's wonderful to see you on this beautiful last Sunday of August. I understand that summer is coming back this week, although I am out of the forecasting business. It sure does look good for the coming week, and it's wonderful that we can begin with worship. Got some announcements to highlight. We got three birthdays in the congregation today. McKenna Keys, Lori Lurkey, and Wendy Lurkey celebrate their birthday today. And on Friday, Kelly Johnson's birthday. So happy birthday. Okay. Have some anniversaries in the church family this week. Today is Pete and Lisa Herrick's anniversary. They were in church on Wednesday night. Tuesday, Danielle and Tony Foytick. Wednesday, Dave and Linda Kiso. Doug and Karen Neal. And then Thursday, Paul and Wendy Wofel. So ha happy anniversary. Hmm. Also, this Wednesday at 6.30, confirmation orientation and youth group meeting for those who are able to attend. That's going to be 6.30, Wednesday night in the back of church. Should last till about 7 o'clock. Um, if you attend that meeting, you get five youth group points, by the way. So I just want to give you a heads up. You get points for that, so for ministry outings. And so we'll plan for the confirmation year. Also, Sunday school kickoff is Sunday, September 13th. We'll install our Sunday school teachers. We'll have Bibles for the third graders. And the sermon that day is going to be called Body Building. We're going to be in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 8 through 16, and talk about how we can build up the body of Christ as members of his church. And then we have worship Thursday night at 6.30. I'm going to try a little experiment. We're going to have church the first Thursday of the month in September. That's this Thursday. And in October. And if we have pretty good attendance, we'll keep her going from there. And there'll be communion at that service as well. So first Thursday of the month, church, 6.30 to about 7.15. Sunday, September 27th, after the service at 10 a.m., we'll have a question and answer time in the sanctuary. You can ask me any questions about my theological beliefs, about scriptural issues, cultural issues, social issues. And if I don't know, I'll say I don't know. I'll get back to you on that. But if I can, I'll do my best in answering, and you'll be able to pin me down theologically. So that'll be... Sunday, September 27th at 10 a.m. Also, let us pray for Emily Kaler. She is going to Texas for tests on September 1st. So she's the 14-year-old girl who has cancer. So we need to keep her in our prayers. Any other announcements or, that we should bring forth at, at this time? Well, then this concludes our morning announcements. And let us pray. Father God, thank you that we can have church today. And we dedicate the worship service to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Greet the person beside you, behind you, and in front of you. And welcome them to Peace Evangelical and Reformed Church. <laughs>
Amen. Let us remain standing for opening song number 492, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms, number 492. Remain standing for the reciting of the Peace Church Statement of Faith found in the back of the songbook on the left side and also on the screen. We believe that the Bible, consisting of the Old and New Testament, is the only inspired, true, authoritative, written Word of God. We believe that there is one God, eternally existing in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We believe in the deity of Jesus Christ, his virgin birth, his sinless life, his miracles, his atoning death, his bodily resurrection, his ascension to the right hand of God the Father, and ultimately, his personal return in power and glory. We believe in the present ministry of the Holy Spirit, whose indwelling power and fullness enables the Christian to live a godly life in this sinful world. We believe that water baptism and the Lord's Supper are sacraments to be observed by the church during this present age. However, the shed blood of Jesus Christ, his resurrection, and his abundant grace provide the only basis for the justification and salvation of all who believe. We believe in the sanctity of human life at every stage. We believe in the spiritual unity of all believers in Jesus Christ. We believe in the bodily resurrection of the dead, of the believer to everlasting joy and blessedness with the Lord of the unbeliever to everlasting conscious punishment. And thank you, you may be seated. The kids can come up. We got any kids here today? The kids can come up and we'll have the children's message. Good morning. Thank you for coming up. 
Today we're going to talk about how we should do good for God in a world that's not always good to us. And it says that in the Bible, in 1 Peter 3.11, that we should turn from evil and do good. And I was just going to ask you, what are some good things that we can do at home that would be an honor to God and a blessing to our families? What are some good things that we can do, even when we're at home? Clean up our rooms, yeah. I, your parents would think that's awesome. I wish I could go back in time and clean my room more than I actually did. Because I realize now how much of a blessing that would be to my parents. That's an excellent suggestion. What are some other good things that we can do? Is there anyone in our families that we could get along with and be nice to, and our parents would like it that we're being nice to them? <laughs> yes. Yeah, what around your house? Oh, yeah, I Yep, all around your house, you know, maybe vacuuming or dusting or playing nice with Maverick or playing nice with, your, with, your, with Will or, you know, right? You could do that. There's so many different ways we can be a blessing. And also um, helping the teacher when the teacher says you have to, it's time to go to your desks, to go to your desks right away, things like that. Let's say a prayer. God, I thank you that you teach us in the book of 1 Peter that we should submit to authorities, that we should continue to do good even if the world is not on the same page with us with God. Help us to be the best Christians we can be for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Bible reading comes from 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 yeah, Peter is all about living for Jesus in a difficult world. And we're at the part now where it's kind of the heart of the book, where Peter's really driving that home. And originally I was going to do 1 Peter 3, verses 13 to 22, but there's way too much cool stuff in there. We're probably only going to get through verse 14 today. I still want to talk about apologetics, that you always have to be prepared to give an answer for the reason, for the hope that you have. That's verse 15. That's a whole sermon all by itself. So we're, we're going to do today, verses 13 and 14, and kind of hit the beginning of this. It's very important. It's the heart of the book. Who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for doing what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear what they fear. Do not be frightened. But in your heart, set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have within you. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. It is better if it is God's will to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. Why is it better? Verse 18. For Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive by the Spirit. This is the inspired, authoritative, written word of God. And may the Lord add his blessing to the reading and preaching of the word. And Father God, we thank you for the scriptures. I pray now that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart would be in faithfulness to the scriptures, in Jesus' name, amen. Jackie Robinson was the first African-American major league baseball player, and he played second base for the Brooklyn Dodgers in 1955, but he wasn't well-received initially. And one time at Ebbets Field, during a home game, he bobbled the ball at second base and committed an error. And the crowd rained booze upon him. They said, Robinson, you stink. You're terrible. You don't belong in Major League Baseball. Get out of here. Go back to the Negro League where you belong. You're no good. And Robinson just stood there with his head down, deflated, discouraged, and humiliated. That's when shortstop Pee Wee Reese came over, and he put his arm around Robinson and stared at the crowd, and they immediately got quiet. Robinson said years later, I was ready to quit baseball right then and there, but that arm around my shoulder saved my career. 
There are times in our lives where we need someone to come alongside us, to put their arm around our shoulder and say, everything's going to be okay. I've got your back. I've got your side. I've got your support. Keep on doing your best for God. Keep on doing good in a world that is not always good to you. Keep on keeping on. And that's what Peter is doing for us here in 1 Peter chapters 2 and 3. He's saying, keep on serving the Lord in an unspiritual, unchristian society. Submit to the governing authorities. Submit to employers and masters. And even submit to serve your unsaved spouses so that they can be won over when they see the beauty and reverence of your lives. Keep on doing good for God. But sometimes it's hard. Sometimes we get tired of being ridiculed, rejected, and misunderstood and underappreciated. Why should I bend over backwards to bring my children up in the ways of the Lord? Why should I get them up on Sunday morning and bring them to church when they show absolutely no spiritual interest at all and they always give me difficulty about coming here? And why should I try my best at work when the people are just going to take credit for themselves when things go right and give me the blame when things go wrong. I feel so unappreciated and don't know why I should be doing my best. And so we really need to talk about this issue. It's important that we understand that God does want us to do good in a world that isn't always good for us. We're going to talk about why we should and how we should. Peter is an apostle and a missionary. But 1 Peter 5 verse 1 also says he's an elder, he's a shepherd, he's a pastor. And he's giving pastoral advice. In 1 Peter 3 verses 11 and 12, he quotes Psalm 34 and says, Turn from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. Why? For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their cry. So even if the people around you do not appreciate what you do for Christ, God appreciates what you do for Christ. He sees everything, and he will bless you and come alongside you and reward you. We live our lives for an audience of one. God sees. And notice the end part of verse 12. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil. That's another reason why we want to do good. We don't want the face of the Lord to be against us. That's Peter's pastoral admonition. But today, we're going to look at Peter's pastoral question in verse 13. Who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? Throughout the Bible, God is very good at asking probing, penetrating questions that get to the heart of a person and cause us to think about what we should be doing or how we can do better at what we're doing for God. It goes all the way back to the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 3. Adam and Eve disobey God from, by eating from the tree they're not supposed to eat from. And when they do that, they re realize their sin and their shame and their nakedness before Almighty God, and they get scared, and they cover themselves with fig leaves and hide in the bushes. And then it says in Genesis 3.8 that the Lord God walked through the garden in the cool of the day, and he could have blasted them. He could have said, you bums, you losers, you dropped the ball, you couldn't obey one lousy commandment, you messed up, I'm mad at you. I'm starting the world all over again, you guys are done. But instead, God asks a pastoral question, just three words. Where are you? Now, he's God. He knows where they are, right? <laughs> he asks the question so that they can think about where they are with God. And they can think about, well, why am I hiding? I used to have sweet fellowship with the Lord. Why am I running from him? Why am I trying to cover over my shame and my sin instead of going to God for grace and forgiveness? So the question is designed to draw out Adam and Eve, and that's what they do. They end up coming out of hiding with that one question, and they have a conversation with the Lord. And then in Jonah chapter 4, there's another example where God asks Beautiful, pointed questions. Now, Jonah is mad because God chose him to preach the message of repentance to the Ninevites, and the Ninevites actually repented. <laughs> and he's mad about that because he hates the Ninevites. The Israelites and the Ninevites are like enemies. It's like oil and water. They don't mix. 
And he goes ballistic when he sees the people turn in the God. And in Jonah chapter 4, Jonah says, Lord, I knew you were going to do that. I knew that you were a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love and faithfulness, blah, blah, blah. But why did you have to save those people? I hate those people. <laughs> and God could have said, just what I need, a hypocritical racist minister. <laughs> You're fired, you know. You know, a Donald Trumpism there. <laughs> he could have done it, and he deserved it, right? But that's not what God does. Instead, God plays a pastoral role in Jonah's life, and he asks him a simple question. Jonah, do you have a right to be angry? Jonah doesn't answer the question because he knows what the answer is. <laughs> I don't have a right to be angry because Almighty God has a right to love who he wants to love. He has a right to redeem who he wants to redeem. He has a right to save who he wants to save. And instead of me being all angry and bitter about who he's saving, I should be thankful that he saved me. Instead of judging other people, I should be praising him that he didn't judge me. And then later on, when Jonah gets angry again, God asks him another pastoral question. The very last verse, Jonah 4, verse 11, he says, Nineveh has 120,000 people who don't know their right hand from their left and many cattle as well. Should I not be concerned about that great city? We saw a couple of weeks ago, Jesus was concerned about a town in Nain, a village of 200 people having a funeral. He also cares about the 120,000 member town. And if God really is slow to anger and abounding in love and compassion, why wouldn't he be concerned about a town of 120,000 people? Of course he's going to be concerned. And that question gets to Jonah's heart. And I love the Lord Jesus Christ because he's just like his father. He asks awesome questions in the Gospels. For example, Luke 6, 46. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? And then again, later on, he says to Nicodemus, if you don't believe me when I speak about earthly things, then how are you going to believe me when I speak about heavenly things? And then he says to the Pharisees, how is it that you let go of the commands of God and hold on to the traditions of men? And he asks the apostles in Mark 7, verse 18, are you so dull? It's one of my favorite questions Jesus asks. You should do a Bible study of all the times Jesus asks people questions and read those questions and see how the Holy Spirit takes those questions and applies it to your own life. I love it when the, the idea of asking questions, it's a great way to get people to do what you want them to do without telling them what to do and get them all offended. <laughs> yeah, a wife might say to her husband, you think we should get the garbage out tonight so we don't have to mess with it tomorrow morning? Husband says, wow, that's a good idea. I'm on that. We'll do that. Now, if she would have said, well, you need to get the garbage out because you forget more than half the time, and I'm the one who has to do it if it ever gets done at all, then he's going to <laughs> he's gonna get defensive, right? <laughs> well, what are you talking about? I'm not going to forget. I'm going to remember that. And then he's going to wake up the next morning, and what's going to happen? Whoops. He's going to forget about it. But this way, by putting it in the form of a question, it comes across as a team idea that we can all get on board with. And that's how Peter's question functions in 1 Peter 3, verse 13. Who is going to harm you if you are eager to do what is good? Yeah, he's got a point there. Even though my boss is not a believer in Jesus Christ, if I'm doing my best and my best is helping his business, he's not going to hurt me for that. He's going to be pleased with that situation. Generally speaking, people appreciate a person who is eager to do what is good, especially when they're doing something good for them. <laughs> That's just the way that usually pans out. For example, there may be somebody at your job who doesn't like you because of your Christian stance on, on biblical issues or social issues. Or maybe they don't like you because you work really hard and they don't work as hard as you do and they, and they know in their heart of hearts they should be working hard. Or maybe they've got some ridiculous, unjustifiable reason why they don't like you. But if you follow the prompting of the Holy Spirit and at Christmas time you get them a card and a box of candy, they might end up saying, you know what, that person's not so bad after all. 
I used to hate them. I want to hate them. It would feel good if I could still hate them, but I can't hate them because they gave me candy. And it happens to be my favorite candy, and I like the candy. Yeah, why should we do that? Galatians chapter 6, verse 10 says, Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to others, especially those who belong to the household of believers. Peter's question was perfect for the situation in central Turkey. Because if Peter had asked that same question in the middle of Rome, who is going to harm you if you are eager for doing good, they would have said, well, how about the government? <laughs> how about Nero? That guy is a maniac. That guy is emotionally unstable. You never know what they're going to do. But Dr. Karen Jobes points out that even though that everyone who wants to live a godly life will be persecuted, we're going to get to that in just a little bit, 2 Timothy 3, verse 12, it wasn't as bad in central Turkey as it was in the middle of Rome. In Rome, they're going to be throwing Christians to the lions. They're going to be burning Christians at the stake. At central Turkey, where Peter is directing this particular letter, that sort of thing isn't happening at this time in 63 A.D., People are being reviled and ridiculed and misrepresented just like we are here in the United States of America, but they're not being thrown to the lions in central Turkey. And so it's still appropriate for Peter to say, who is going to harm you if you are eager to do what is good? Years back, my pastor at Ohio University was Pastor Bill Hickson, and you can listen to his sermons online. I think they're phenomenal. I think he's one of America's greatest living preachers, expositors of the Word of God today. Well, he tells a story about how one time he witnessed an, a car accident where somebody barreled through a stop sign and hit a lady, and her head hit the dashboard. And later on, she would need over 60 stitches, so she was bleeding. She was really hurt. And Pastor Hickson and somebody else ran over to the car, you know, without thinking, all adrenaline, opened the door, and are you all right? One called 911, and Pastor put a cloth on her wounds. And then when he was doing that, he happened to look back, and in the back seat there was a German shepherd and a Rottweiler. And he thought to himself, it's going to be a miracle of God if I don't get bit by at least one of those dogs, you know. But as it went on... He noticed how docile the dogs were. And it's almost like they instinctively knew that Pastor Hickson was there to help and not to hurt. That he was there to be a blessing and not a burden. And Peter is saying that people, generally speaking, have that same instinct like dogs. People know deep down whether or not you are there to be a blessing rather than a burden. And so as a general rule, they are not going to harm you if you choose to do what is good. Therefore, keep being a blessing at work. Keep doing your best in your family to raise your children in the ways of the Lord, knowing that God is watching, God is blessing, and God is helping. Peter asks a pastoral question. Number two, in verse 13, he issues a pastoral expectation. He expects that since you have been born again into a living hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that you are going to be eager to do what is good. And the Greek word for eager is zelotes. It's where we get the word zealot. It describes somebody who is a loyalist or a patriot or a zealot for a good cause. And in this instance, a, the, cause of Jesus, uh, the cause of Jesus Christ. Dan and Kim Breen joined our church a couple of years ago. You guys remember them. And I'll never forget, because we were doing membership class, and they were sitting in my office, and they said, Pastor Mark, we want you to know that we don't believe in the kind of church membership where we get our names on the roll and we come to the occasional Sunday service and that's it. We believe that God has called us to serve. We believe that God has called us to be involved with ministry. We want to help in any way we can. And boy, I'll tell you, they backed up those words. They taught Sunday school, third through sixth grade. They sang in the potter's clay. They were faithful at Thursday night Bible study. And maybe you even remember a couple of Sundays, they stood up during announcements and exhorted people to come to the Thursday night Bible study class. Like so many of you, they were eager and zealous to do what is good. 
And Peter is saying, I expect that to be the norm. I expect everybody to be like that. I expect that you are going to be zealous and full of desire to be involved in some kind of ministry. I expect that somebody's going to want to help out Sherry Hernke and teach at least one Sunday a month in the fifth and sixth grade Sunday school class now that Dan and Kim Breen have moved on to Ohio. I expect that there are going to be people who are going to want to greet people in church in the name of the Lord at least one time a year. I expect that there are going to be people who are going to want to usher. I expect that there are people who are going to want to share their faith and bring their friends to Christ and build them up in the faith. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. If you're here today and you're not a believer in Jesus Christ, this is a great verse for you to look up. I know a lot of people who became Christians who got saved off of reading Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. It says, we are saved by grace through faith, and this is not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, so that no one should boast. But notice in verse 10, the same grace that saves us changes us and inspires us to do the works of God. Ephesians 2.10, for we are God's workmanship. The Greek word there is poema. It's where we get get our word poem. We are God's poem. We are his, his masterpiece created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. If you're... If you are not doing the works of God, if you're not involved in some kind of ministry, either you are not truly born again, or you're missing the whole reason why we were born again to begin with. We weren't born again just to sit. We were born again so we could serve. That's what Paul is saying in Ephesians 2.10. That's what Peter is saying in 1 Peter chapter 3. He asks a pastoral question and issues a pastoral expectation that you will be eager to do what is good. Number three, he makes a pastoral qualification. As a general rule, no one is going to harm you for doing good, but I know from experience I need to qualify this. If you should suffer for doing what is right, you are blessed. You know, sometimes we make these categorical statements and we need to qualify them so that we don't give people the wrong idea or false expectations. For example, I was telling somebody the other day that Schwartz's Supper Club in St. Anne has sensational steaks. They have some of the best steaks that I have tasted in this area. But I have to give a qualification. They're really expensive. <laughs> a few years ago, I got a T-bone steak there for $18.99. Now, it's like $26.99 or $27.99. Their prices have really gone up. And so I'm going to be misleading if I don't qualify my statement by giving you a heads up that, hey, you better bring your wallet with you. <laughs> you better make sure there's some money with you when you pay that bill. And Peter's making the same qualifications about his statement. As a general rule, people will appreciate that your intentions are good and you're eager to do what is good, but sometimes you will suffer persecution. Look what happened to Peter in Acts chapter 4 and 5. The apostles were arrested for proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead, and they were even flogged for their faith. But Acts chapter 5, verse 40 and 41 says that when the apostles left the Sanhedrin, they were rejoicing because they they were considered worthy to suffer disgrace for the sake of the name. And in Acts chapter 12, Peter is arrested for his faith in Christ. But after he gets away, he tells people about it. And then he says to everyone, I want you to spread the word. Tell James and the other brothers about what happened to me. And even Jesus warns Peter that he's going to get persecuted. You remember in John chapter 21, verse 18, Jesus says to Peter, right now you can get up and get dressed and go wherever you want to go. But the days are coming when you will get up and somebody else will dress you and take you to where you do not want to go. And contrary to some opinions, this is not talking about the day that Peter ends up at Chilton Village and somebody else is dressing him there. This is talking about how Peter will someday be taken to the place of execution and he will die a martyr's death for the Lord. That there will be situations like that where we suffer 
persecution. And even today, we live in a world where parents are sometimes castigated and criticized for having the courage to discipline their children in the love and admonition of the Lord. You discipline your children that way? Oh, that is so politically incorrect. We don't do that stuff anymore. And you might have to take heat for that, you know. And we live in a society where if a Christian baker feels that baking a cake for this particular circumstance goes against their religious convictions and they don't feel comfortable with it, not only will they be castigated and criticized, they could be excoriated and they could lose their business. And we live in a culture where Christians in the Middle East are being exterminated left and right by militant Muslims and nobody's lifting a finger to talk about it. No one's doing anything about it. This is the Holocaust of our time when brothers and sisters in Christ are being killed and people are just ignoring it, just like they did with the Jewish people in their Holocaust. And Peter is saying, if you're in a situation where you are suffering for doing what is right, for, for sticking to the Word of God, you are blessed. And you're thinking, well, you know, I don't feel blessed when people give me grief. I don't feel blessed when people give me difficulties. Exactly in what ways am I blessed? Three ways. Number one, Peter says you are blessed if you suffer persecution because you have the honor of, of joining in the sufferings of Jesus Christ. First Peter chapter 4, verse 13. Rejoice that you are participating in the sufferings of Christ. That's what Paul said in Acts 21, and 22, and 23. He didn't say, oh no, I might get killed in Jerusalem for my faith. I better not share the gospel. He said, you know what? It is an honor to suffer for Christ. If I should have to suffer for Jesus, if I should have to die in Jerusalem for my faith, I'm willing to do it because I love Jesus more than man's opinion. I love Jesus more than anything else. And I'm willing to do it. The second thing the reason why it is a blessing to suffer for doing what is right is because it is evidence that the spirit of glory and of God is upon you. That's 1 Peter 4, verse 14. Number three, a third reason why it is a blessing to suffer for doing what is right is because great is your reward in heaven. There's a story about Pastor Charles Spurgeon who was being given a lot of grief by people in the community for his social and cultural and theological stands for Christ. And he would come home every night discouraged, deflated, frustrated, and humiliated. And his wife wanted to help in some way, because Pastor Spurgeon's a great pastor, but he still struggles with depression, seasons of depression. And so his wife decided to take a scripture verse and put it on a big poster and plastered it on the bedroom wall. And she made her husband read that scripture every night when he came home from work. And you know what that scripture was? Matthew 5, verses 10 through 12. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So every single night, Charles Spurgeon came home to the encouraging words of Almighty God. And I want the word of God to to encourage you today. Maybe as parents, sometimes your kids don't appreciate all that you're trying to do to bring, bring them up in the ways of the Lord. They, the idea of coming to church is like, oh man, I gotta go to church. Oh, Sunday school. Oh man, I gotta go to Sunday school. And it's like grief at every turn and every corner. And sometimes it even escalates more beyond that. You could sit down with them and say this. You can say, look, I know we're not always going to agree on what your mother and I decide. I can appreciate and understand that. But I want you to know from the bottom of my heart that all I want to do is be the best parent that I can be for the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to be the kind of person that makes Jesus proud. I love Jesus more than anyone else in heaven, and I love you more than anything else on earth. So please pray for me, my son. Please support me and help me to be the best me I can be. And if you're at work and there are people who don't like the way you're working, just let your life and your works do the talking. Don't try to get defensive and say, hey, what about you or anything like that. Let God worry about them. You continue to do your best. 
Do your best and let God take care of the rest. That's what it means to do good in a world that's not always good to us. I heard about a guy who was hired to work along the highways, picking up trash along the road. I used to have a job like that when I was in college for summer money for school. And this one group of people that has worked there for a long time noticed how fast and furious the new guy was working. And they said, you know, you don't need to do that. <laughs> you don't need to work so hard. The boss isn't watching. And the guy looked up and said, yes, he is. <laughs> I live for the Lord. And so that's what I want you to do. I want you to realize that the boss is watching and that the eyes of the Lord really do range throughout the earth. And you know another reason why we should do this is because Jesus did good in a world that wasn't always good to him. Amen? Acts chapter 10, verse 38, it says that the Lord Jesus Christ went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. And Jesus did the ultimate good when he went to the cross and died for our sins and said, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. And then he rose again on the third day. And if we repent of our sin and believe in him, we have eternal life. And then we too can follow in the path of our Savior by doing good in a world that's not always good and kind to us. I invite you to Jesus. God is love and Jesus loves you. This I know. For the Bible tells me so. Amen. We'll remain seated and sing our song of commitment, verse 1 and verse 4 of number 413, living for Jesus, a life that is true. Do we have any special prayer requests that we should lift up? Yes, Jane. Oh, 
Okay, pray for all the kids whether they're, that are going back to school, whether it's 4K or graduate school, or, and all in between. And the teachers. Yeah. And the confirmation teachers, too. Yeah, Billy. Okay, need to pray for Billy's sister, Robin, who has a job interview in a couple days. Pray that it goes well and that the Lord will give that into her hands and she'll have that job as he wills. Yes, Fuzzy. Okay, we'll pray for Kathy's dad, Alan, who has eye surgery on Thursday. Yes, Lynn. Okay, we will lift those requests up to the Lord. Yes, Steve. All this, the bad things that are going on in the world? Okay, famine. That sounds good. We'll do that. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you that we can lay our requests before you and wait in expectation. And I really love the way prayer is pictured in Revelation chapter 8 as bowls of fragrant incense that are lifted up to God. Thank you, Lord, that that's the way it, our prayers are seen from heaven. And, and we thank you for the privilege of being able to do this. We pray, Lord, also for the requests that have been brought forward. We think about the college kids and as they go back to school and, and help them, Lord, to get reacclimated to the academic life and help them, Lord, also to be grounded in the scriptures and to be grounded in relationship with you, that when they go back to school that they don't leave Jesus at home, that they um, carry on their relationship with God at school. We pray for all the kids from 4K, from nursery, all the way through grad school. And Lord, we just pray that you would watch over them, bless them, protect them, and may this be a great year of learning and devotion. Be with those who are entering their senior year and about to um, do their last year of high school. I pray, God, that, that this would be a year where not only they grow in wisdom and knowledge, but that they are confirmed in the collegiate or academic calling that you have placed on their lives beyond high school, that you would lead, guide, and direct. Lord, we pray for Robin Levinston. We pray for Billy's sister who has a job interview on Tuesday. We pray, Lord, that you would help her to do a great job interviewing. We pray, Lord, that you would open up an opportunity for her to, to do a, a job like that that's even better than the one that she has, that you would bless her in that capacity. Lord, also we pray for Kathy Weeding's dad, Alan, who has eye surgery on Thursday. And we pray, Lord, that the surgeon would bring his A game to the operating room and do a great job and we pray for his healing. Pray also, Lord, for Lynn Stecker's dad, Dave Brantmeyer, for his salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. We pray for her aunt, her aunt Sue Wallersheim, who has dealt with some health concerns, with some frequent seizures. We pray, Lord, that you would step in and be her great physician and give her relief and healing from those. We pray, Lord, also for, for her Lynn's sister, Becky Borneman, and her husband and the kids that you would help the family to, to grow in love and unity in relationship to Jesus. Because Colossians 1 verse 17 says that in Christ all things hold together, including marriage. Lord, we also want to pray for those who are starving. We know that there are 150 million kids who are malnourished in this world. That, and that's why the youth group did the 30-hour famine. That's why we're raising that support, because it it, it pierces our hearts with sadness and grief. And we pray, God, that as Christians, you would help us to um, do the best that we can to provide food and resources to people that we know who are in great need. Lord, we pray for our leaders. Give us wisdom. We pray, God, that you would give us wise people who will govern diligently and will be godly and, and make discreet choices, wise choices. Pray for our soldiers. Keep them safe both here and around the world. Thank you for their sacrifices. 
Most of all, God, we thank you for Jesus himself, who taught us to pray the Lord's Prayer, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you for worshiping God with us today. We want to leave you with a word of blessing and encouragement. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen. God bless you and have a terrific day and go in peace.